Welcome back to Heroes Next Door. Thank you all for watching. Today we are doing another Station Cribs. We are at the New Hope Eagle Fire Company, so let's go take a look. Once again, thank you for joining us today. I just want to let you know right off the bat that my voice is a little hoarse today because we've been doing a lot of filming, trying to get you guys a lot of information. Also, I've been working hard. We had a pretty major fire recently, so you know I was up all night. So I'm going to do a lot less talking today, but uh, I got a bunch of friends here. I'm going to first introduce you to uh, their president, who is uh, Keith McMillan. Thank you for inviting us in. Welcome here. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome yeah. to New Hope. So listen, we're the New Hope Eagle Fire Company. Uh, the, what we're proud of is this will, next year will be our 200th year anniversary. Wow. Um, so uh, 1822, this fire company formally put a charter together to protect both New Hope and Lambertville back at that point in time. This is our fourth firehouse. Okay. And later on, you're going to get to see some of our history when we tour the museum. Okay. In our building, we have a unique relationship. We actually have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week paid paramedic. Okay. And that's through Central Bucks uh, Emergency Medical Services. Okay. That's the only paid staff member that's at the Eagle Firehouse, but time's of the essence. Okay, and where are you located? In we New Hope is approximately 30 miles north of Philadelphia, right on the Delaware River, approximately three miles away from where Washington crossed the Delaware. <laughs> okay. And we are a stone's throw from Lambertville, New Jersey. Okay, and you have a bunch of different apparatus here. One of the things that we haven't seen, we're gonna talk about later, is your marine Correct. aspect of it. So, we are probably one of the busiest marine rescue companies in the area, and we work up and down the river with our mutual aid companies. We've already, and you can sort of see up on the wall, the guys keep a tally. Okay. We've already had six life saves so far this summer. Wow. Uh, responding on the river, uh, which is very dangerous a lot of times, and people just don't understand that. Right, right. Now, you, I've re heard recently you've had some pretty good floods, too. Not just the river issues, but you have rain. We get flash floods, and because of our assets, we've been lucky this summer. Those flash floods have been about five miles that way and five miles that way. But we've gotten called in with our assets to assist with those flash flood rescues. Okay. So you're a fire company. You have EMS here. Correct. And you're a rescue company or just marine? We do not do heavy rescue. We do have extrication tools on our first out engine. But... We pride ourselves in being a great engine company, a water shuttle company, and you'll get to see our tanker a little later on, and a marine rescue company. Okay. We do have a ladder truck, a 100-foot Pierce aerial, but we also have mutual aid companies on both sides of us that have aerials. So it tends to be the last truck out at this point. Okay, okay. And you're going to introduce me to some of your guys as we go through the building, right? Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. let's go take a look. All right. As I had said, we have the 24-7 paramedic unit. And nice then I want to introduce you to Topher Taylor. Okay. Hey, Topher, how you doing, buddy? Good, how you doing? Thanks for taking me around. Of course. So, uh, we got a bunch of little questions for you. All you right. know, first of all, what do you got in the apparatus bay? All right, so one of our newest assets we have here is the Can-Am Defender. It's a UTV we got from uh, Virginia. Uh, like I said, we are talking about the water rescues. A lot of times, while they're still in the water, sometimes they get out, people will just slip, and they walk on the towpath, and they just go home. Okay. We'll be out there for eight hours before searching. Middle of the night, they don't tell us. This is great. We can go on the towpath now, go up and down a lot quicker than rather on foot. Okay. Also, with the towpath, we had a lot of bicycle injuries and things like that, and assisting the squad. They said, you throw guys in this, get up and down. Also, with all the field fires, we do have a lot of farms and things like that nearby. So this offers us uh, some unique opportunities, again, places we normally can't. Right, This right. is only about five weeks old. Okay. So now, can you pull great. some of your apparatus, some we of your can. boats? We actually we pulled our jet ski with it before. We can use it for things like that, again, tighter spaces. It's got a front winch on the front. Um, we got air conditioning. We got everything in there. So we can use it winter, summer. It doesn't really matter. That's awesome. Um, even, like, downtown when it gets crazy on the weekend, you can get around. If you just need utility for, like, medical calls and things like that. Okay, okay. Probably going to our bigger one now. Yeah. This is our tanker. This is a 2014. Uh, it's 4,200 gallons. It's one of the biggest in the county, if not the biggest. Um, they spent a lot of time customizing this. There's chutes, there's a discharge and intake on each side. Okay. Which, if you're familiar with water shuttling, is very important because you can just right. nose in, back in, side. You don't have to worry about you know flipping around, turning around. Makes it a lot easier. I heard this has a pump on it too. It does. Right? Yes, this has a pump. 
Uh, I believe it's a 1500 uh, gallon per minute pump. Okay. Uh, this goes all over the place. Um, we go in Hardin with a lot. We go all over Bucks County. We've been on a few big mulch fires and Warrington had one, Langhocken had one where they right. did over a million gallons of water. Yeah, I just had a, a recent fire that we had to call in a tanker task force. Yep. Do you have a tanker task force up here? Are you part of that? Yeah, so we're part of most of the tanker task force in the area. Um, on our boxes and most of the other mutual aid boxes, you normally have two or three other tankers and you can request them. Basically, if anyone in the central area of Bucks County requests a tanker task force, we're going to be on it going. Because there are other tankers in the area, but some of them are only 2,000 gallons, where we're 4,200, so we can kind of bring a lot of water. Right. And it makes them a little happier when something this big shows up. Right, right. Yeah, we appreciate that. I yeah. definitely used you guys the other day. So. Yeah. All right, next to this is what? This is engine 46. This is first out for basically everything, unless there's a special call. Um, as Keith had mentioned, this does have extrication tools on the other side. It's not a rescue, but it's just short, but minus some airbags, has full rescue complements. Okay, with all so your you spreaders. can stabilize the vehicle, you can yep. do door pop, we handle maybe take a window. We handle all auto extrications on our own. We okay. have rescue companies do on them, but we basically normally can handle before they get there. Okay. Um, obviously, we have our attack lines up front. We have our hoses on the side. We right. do carry marine rescue bags up top. Okay. Um, besides that's a standard engine, nothing too crazy about it. A okay. uh, thousand gallons of water, so it is a little bit more water than most engines right. are. Um, we have some high rise bags on our side because downtown we and also we have what we would call McMansions, these massive homes. Yeah. So not necessarily high rise operations, but we pull a three hundred foot line or two and a half, and we have to use that as basically leader line and go into operation because you could have a 700 foot stretch in some of these mansions. Right, right. So there's some ex extension Are driveways packs. an issue? Yes. Yeah. So going into driveways, this is a quick attack. This is a 300 gallon tank. It's a 1500 gallon per minute pump again. Um, this is a 2019. Uh, we've used this. This has been on a few fires already. Okay. Um, with some two-man crew. This followed up by that tanker. It's basically an engine and all you could ever need with water. Wow. It's worked great. Um, we recently put the Zodiac on top due to the recent flooding okay. with a 15 horse uh, motor on the side here. Right. I'll just show you this one compartment right sure. here. It's basically an engine, just short, you know, a few basic things. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got two hand lines, you got a full pump panel, you got ladders up top there with some hard suction so you can actually bury this and do some drafting out of ponds and pools if you need to. Right, right. This has got to be much easier to drive than a regular big old fire exactly, truck, too. Exactly, yeah. It's just, like I said, those McMansions, some of them have gates, and it's real tight going in. Some of them are up hills. There's some that this is the only thing that will fit, that if we get a fire, this is dropping in, and everyone else is going to have to walk up. So this is a F550 platform, 650? Uh, this is a 550, yeah. Okay. F550, okay. Uh, another Pierce, winch on the front again. Wow. So it's kind of, it's very diverse right now, but it can be used as an engine. It's also got uh, some spreaders on the back as well, so you can do some light extrication okay. and things like that. Um, very light tools and things like that, just so you can kind of get a start on something before, you know, everyone else shows up. Yeah, that's pretty cool to have. Oh, yeah. So, as we were walking by back of the engine here, I noticed you got a massive military truck. What yep. is this about? So this is our special service 46. This is, I believe, somewhere around the 80s. Okay. It's an old military five-ton truck. We got this through the Terry, Terry Farrell Foundation. Okay. And as it sits right now, you can see this water line. It can go through this water right here, no problem. Okay. You can get uh, kits that you can actually make it so it goes underwater all the way. You okay. Get a snorkel. Uh, this is great for flood rescues. We've had this up in Percocy in Milford over the last two years for apartment buildings flooding. Okay. You lose back up, everyone can climb in the back, and there's no problem at all. So this is minimum water level that you would... This is our max maximum? here. Once yeah. you get above here, you can still keep going. The problem is then you're in the cab and things like that. So then you start getting wet. Exactly. <laughs> but you can go higher, and especially with the snorkel kits, you can go even higher. Wow. Um, we've used this for snow as well. Okay. Kind of any rough weather we can use it in. Right, right. But yeah, this thing's a beast. It's another specialty tool that not everybody has, but if yeah. you're in that area where you have the water yep. issues, you know, it's, it's good to have when you need yeah, it. Yeah, there's only a few in the county. There's only like one or two in Harden. There's, I think there's only maybe three or four in Bucks County. So it's a nice little tool we can have, especially with our area. And there was flooding here back in 05 and 06, where if we would have had this back then, right. it would have been so much better and so much safer for a lot of the operations they were doing. Right. And, and safety is the key. You know, yeah. we look at these things, you're like, why do you need such a big truck like that? It's really making sure that the volunteers are safe mm -hmm. and making sure you're getting to all the residents that you, you have. Exactly. To to. Yeah. So, Rather than having to go through all the water, you know, you never know what's in all the contaminants. Right. It's easier if you just drive through your back end. People jump in the back. They stay dry. You get them out of there real quick. Just makes the whole operation a lot easier. Very cool. 
Do you like driving it? Yes, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you got here? So this is Tower 46. It's a 100 foot bucket, as you can see. Um, it's one of our older trucks, it's a 96. Uh, once again, it's a pretty standard. You know, you got five inch off the back. This has a 300 gallon tank. You got attack, attack lines on the side. Um, it's basically a quint, just a little different. You know what I mean? It's a little bit bigger. Right, right. Um, probably gonna be getting rid of this soon, looking into getting a new ladder or a quint kind of to help replace some different things, but. Okay. Okay. I guess Keith mentioned earlier, it's one of the last things to go, unfortunately, because so, we are surrounded. Maybe we'll put a shout out, you know, <laughs> yeah. if anybody's looking for a Anyone's tower, looking for it. Yeah, you know, hit them up, maybe they can there you go. give you a good deal here. So we finished up with Topher here, now we're on the Pride and Joy side. This is their marine side. We're going to meet up with one of their guys, Steve Burrows, and he has a lot of information in regards to these. Hey Steve, thanks for inviting us out. Hey, glad to have you. So this is not a normal wave runner or jet ski. This is something that's very unique to this area, right? Uh, jet ski on steroids. <laughs> okay. It's an aluminum ski. It's made out of Alaska. It's heavy gauge aluminum. Okay. So you got a regular jet ski motor, but it's a uh, heavy gauge aluminum. And in our area, we got a lot of rocks and a lot of bad water. And you know, a regular jet ski would uh, get yeah. pretty broke up. Yeah, this, with that fiberglass, you just right. knock right through it. I mean, it, so. you can see the dents and stuff that we've had. This is, we bought this used, but okay. we, we put a couple dents into it. Right. But um, yeah, it works very well in our uh, wing dam and low water situations. Uh, it can carry up to four people. It can carry more than that, but normally, you know, with a rescue, the board drops down. You can you can put them on the board. Okay. Um, what is it? A four cylinder engine? What? what yeah. It's, who, it's a regular Yamaha okay. wave runner yeah, uh, yeah. motor. And like I said, we've got extra throw bags. Um, these are all custom made through. Yeah, a company? these are custom made. It's a Lumiski uh, out of Alaska. Okay. And um, it's an amazing product. You know, it's just like. You know. How long have you had this? Going on like six years. And this year you've already put it out how many times? Uh, let's see. We had two rescues, which you had the video of the one rescue. Yeah. Um, and then there was another rescue before that. So, yeah, we've had it out like almost, you know, four or five times, you know. Just this year? Just, just this year, yeah. Wow, we, it's wow. It's going to be a busy season. So this ski can be pulled by your uh, Can-Am also, right? Yes, it can. But yes, it's it already pre-hooked to one of your vehicles? Right. It's pre-hooked. Um, sometimes we'll run into an area where we can't get this vehicle into it. Okay. Hook it to the Can-Am. The Can-Am can take it in. Yeah, the Can-Am is going to work out really well in our, our local because there's a lot of tight spots, and this is, uh, gets you in the tight spots and gets you out of the tight spots, as you've seen on that vi video. Uh, right. These guys did that rescue. So the, one of the questions that's going to pop up, yeah, I know they're going to ask, is what do I have to do to become a rescue guy? Is there certain classes I need to take? Is there, you know, can I just join in? and just Because I know how to wa ride a wave runner. Can I, can I do this? Well, um, there's classes. There's swift water awareness and swift water ops. Okay. And that's basically to help save yourself if you get in trouble. Okay. You know, and that, with that class, you do need a uh, jet ski license or a boat license okay. to uh, operate. Um, you have to be 18. Okay. You know, like I said, the guys that just made that rescue, they just turned 18. Right. And they did an excellent job. But that's, we could still train you. Uh, before that, but 18 helps uh, the insurances and all sure, that sort of stuff. Sure, sure. But we have just got people to come in to join to do water rescue. Okay. And they don't want to take all the fire, you know, fire classes are, you know, it's 300 hours almost. Right, and right. With this, you could do the uh, awareness online, the operations they do down at Scudders Falls. There's a standing wave down there. Uh, There's a um, couple classes down there a year. And really easy you know okay now what's pulling this this is a uh, old this was expedition? it was our yeah it's oh, a, no, it's a, a tahoe. tahoe it's okay. tahoe it was our chief's uh, former chief's car okay and um we just upgraded the chief's car so they just made it a utility to to pull it okay and in front of this this is your newest piece of apparatus this is our newest piece yes. wow look at this thing it's a 2021 okay uh, american airboat out of orange texas we had a uh one before this, but we it was 20 years old, so we, we upgraded. Okay. Uh, American Airboat, they make an excellent product. Um, Squad 175 across the river has one. It was one of their first rescue boats that they made. It got damaged in the flooding in Bound Brook. They sent it out, they had fixed, and a guy changed the rate configuration or something happened, and they were tra training down in the falls, and got swamped and they sunk the boat oh so they contacted american airboat sent him video the guy actually came up here to check the water out and he built their very first 
uh, rescue boat and it's heavier gauge aluminum. But this is their out of the box rescue. Very good. This is a got a supercharged motor. Wow. So that looks like an LS1 out of a Corvette. Yeah. Right. It's, <laughs> but it's a marine block because that's the best uh, motor that they, they find. The, they used to make them with car motors, but right. you know, they, they get away with that. So some of the real neat stuff that we have on here is we have wireless headsets. Okay. So the rescuers don't have to be hooked to the boat. It goes right through the radio. Okay. So you put this on. Right. Turn it on and actually transmits through our radio to, to the dispatch. So you can be up on the front of the boat looking out while right. you, one's driving. It you is. don't have to be hooked when in. When the rescuers go off the boat, line of sight, I can talk to them on an island or something like that if they're doing a search. And this, if they get in trouble, they can actually talk to county and saying, I'm in trouble. The radio we have, it's a quad band. Okay. So it's a multiple band radio. I can talk to Hunterdon County. I can talk to Bucks County. I can talk to Marine, uh, Coast Guard. We could have it programmed to anything. It's a real neat asset that we have. Right. A little expensive, but in if scheme you're of doing things, this kind of work, you have right. to have the right tools. Exactly, and it can do anything. And we have we have a preset that makes it so the operator sitting up there can just scroll the band and get any channel that we need. Okay. Along One of the unique things that I see looking at this when I take a step back, what's this big bar that's going across, and what's the purpose of that? Well, you know those trees that droop down along the banks and okay. stuff like that? Yeah. Well, if you catch one of them in the face, it hurts. Okay. So if we have to nose into the to the bank, the bar helps push the trees push away. The trees away. Right? Okay. Our other one didn't have it. Our other one didn't have the windshield. Okay. So when we upgraded it, we figured the windshield's better because it, the bugs on the river are terrible. Okay. Right? They, it's just the nighttime, it, it's, it's crazy. So they, when they spec the new boat out, they, they put the bar on. Right. Any low-hanging wires that put it exactly. up and over too. There is a cable uh, up in the next local, up there. Point Pleasant has one that goes across the river, and sometimes when the river's high, okay, you, you can't run that side of the river because the cable goes across. Gotcha. So, the lighting, we got enough lights. It looks like a you could light up a football field. So you can do rescue operations at night or during the right. daytime. And with the rescue operations at night, I'm going to just skip ahead to that. Okay. We have Gen 2 night vision. Got two pairs of Gen 2 night vision goggles. Wow. Now I'm not pushing Cabela's, but that's where we got it, right? <laughs> right. And these have helped out many times. What I do is I run dark. Right. With no lights, moonlight, and then the rescuers sit on the side and they look through the night vision, pick up the heat signatures, and I can then direct call, it over call there. It in. Yeah, we had one uh, five years back or so, missing girl tuber. Okay. She got on the railroad bed over in New Jersey, and she got lost. It's dark. Right. We get put out for the rescue. I start up river. One guy looks Pennsylvania. One guy looks Jersey. I go to center river, and they spot a heat signature. It was a ranger. Okay. They pulled over. Said, "Now we haven't found her yet." Right. We, let, we pull it off, get up uh, 100 yards maybe. So you can't see from me to you, okay. it's so dark. Right. Had another signature, it was her. And we said, stay there, we'll get the ranger. So we went back down, told the ranger and got her home. But that's- uh, That's pretty cool to have. Yeah, these are, they're, they were expensive, but like I said, they you save a life, it's worth all the pennies you exactly. spend. So what is this towed by? What's the vehicle that it's towed by? Uh, this is a Chevy, um, it looks like a Redding kind of box on the back of it. Yeah, utility it's a 3500 uh, Chevy utility. It okay. was our fire police truck at one time. Okay. And we switched it over to Marine Asset because of the compartmentation. We had the Zodiac on top. Okay. And um, it's a diesel. Right. Really good thing. We're, we're looking to replace, but not, not right now. Okay. Um, it's got... The compartment but it has for, plenty of power to pull this big oh, plenty of power to pull you know all our rope bags when you go out on a rescue about how many guys do you try to put on the boat uh three i could i can take four but three is comfortable because you know it just gives you two rescuers and the the operator and then the, and and the spare okay you know we have the stokes here yep and that comes out that's usually in the utility but uh so the for the ems they can they can work on um 
the patient. We've had a couple of times where we had to, you know, bring them offshore under the boat and then down to the EMS because of logistics of before we had the UTV where we could we could have took it right. taken them down that way. We also take an iPad with us for okay. weather yep. because we've been out there and it gets nasty when you see the lightning, so it gives us a chance to get off, but we can we can FaceTime between the iPad and the Chief's car. So we've got all the technology. It's just uh, hopefully we don't have to use it all. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to show us. This no is problem. some pretty cool equipment. We want to continue looking at your station and see what you have. Oh, there's plenty of all right. that, yeah. All right. I hear you guys got a museum, so we're going to hit that too. So we're finished up here in the apparatus bay. We're going to meet back up with Keith. The one thing that I want to mention is, you know, it's kind of nice talking to a couple different guys throughout the firehouses. You know, all too often I do a lot of the talking, but really the people behind this are the people that make this thing run. So once again, we're going to run into Keith. He's going to show us the rest of the house here. Um, Good to see you again. Yeah. Hope the guys took care of you. Yeah, yeah. A lot of information. Come on in. So uh, what we're going to walk into is our, we got our day kitchen. Okay. okay. Sort of under construction right now because we're switching over from propane to natural gas from Pico. So new gas lines and things. Okay, so it's a little there. disarray, but you got it all working on. And then this is our training room. Uh, as I uh, had mentioned, during COVID, we had only in-house crews unless it became a tactical box or above. And then guys would come in. We also have the 24-7 medic. Right. We wanted to keep people apart. So the 24-7 medics were upstairs and this sort of became a bunk room for the day crews. Sure. Um, sure. But this is where we do our training right. and sometimes have some meetings. We can actually set this up, put 50 people in here if we need to. Yeah. We have the TV, which will play your videos once you get them posted. <laughs> All right. And a, a, you know, the whiteboard to do things like that. It's a great multi-purpose room. It's got plenty of room to set up wherever you need. Right yeah. now you have a kind of a boardroom setting and teach it, but you can move these out of the way and do training scenarios. Absolutely. Uh, and and he, we can even allow some of our members, they might want to have a birthday party in here. Right. It, it, it's designed to be very flexible. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, having the technology to teach your classes. Pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. All right. What else do we have around All here? All right. So if you follow me, we're going to go out and I can show you our banquet facility. So coming out here, we're heading to your banquet hall, right? Heading to our banquet facility. Again, you're in a hall right here. This was part of our original building in 1973. Okay. The banquet hall was built a few years later. And back when we built it, it was the only banquet facility in the area. Okay. Um, today, it's actually closed as a banquet hall. We now use it for meetings and training. It is also, we are a designated evacuation center. So okay. in Sandy, uh, we fed an average of 200 people a day out of this banquet hall and the kitchen. Okay. So those who are watching right now, Sandy was a hurricane that hurricane came Hurricane Sandy in 2011. Right. The building was under construction at the time. Okay. But wasn't done. Okay. And, but this part of the building was here. Okay. Uh, we actually had a tenant who ran this as a banquet hall for us for a number of years. They made a major investment in it for us. And regrettably due to the COVID pandemic, it wasn't working for them and okay. they had to back out. Okay. We're firemen, we're not banquet guys. We were very lucky that in New Hope, if anybody's familiar with it, parking is a huge issue. Okay. We had a local establishment ask if instead of renting the banquet hall, could they rent our banquet parking lot? We make the same money renting a parking lot effortless <laughs> right. as we did renting out the banquet hall. Okay. We do have one of the largest commercial kitchens in the borough. Right. Holy moly. This thing and is And as I said, um, after Hurricane Sandy, we were feeding an average of 200 people a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner okay. out of this kitchen, mainly staffed by our volunteers, as well as people who had come here to take shelter, jumped in and helped. Right. And also uh, the gracious generosity of Costco, who delivered a tractor trailer full of food about every other day. Right. We were able to feed all the Pico linemen, all the linemen that came from Florida, Indiana, Chicago, uh, and then the local people who needed a place to stay warm and to feel safe after all the devastation we had of Sandy right. around here. This thing is absolutely huge. You have commercial grade sink and washers here for all your dishes. You have a line cook, 
you know, you have all the commercial grills and and everything that you need. Everything you need for a restaurant. Um, the the only thing we don't have, but it'll be here in a few months, is a, a big fryer, a deep fryer. Okay. Uh, one of our members owns a restaurant, which he has recently sold. Okay. And the deep fryer is coming here. <laughs> Whether we'll use it or not, we don't know. You never but, know. Um, like you said, there there are those weather incidents where you know people are going to be here. It's a it's a safe place for people to come and yes. and the fact that you guys as a fire company have the ability to open your doors mm -hmm. not just for your members but for the members of the community and like you said for the pico guys you have the space to use and you're using it really well and our philosophy if it weren't for those people we wouldn't have all this right uh we sustain ourselves we get about a third of our budget in tax dollars a third of our budget is from donations, and a third is from some businesses that we run. Nothing sophisticated, we run a parking lot. Okay. And again, those familiar with New Hope, parking is probably the best business to be in, and that helps us be able to afford what we have. Here. Okay. Now, you also have a substation too, right? We do have a small substation. It's about three and a half, four miles away. Uh, the substation is in a very unique part of our district. It's mainly, uh, somebody earlier mentioned McMansions, okay. uh, farms, not a lot of people. So we have right now about five or six guys up at the substation. We do have a second tanker up there, a 3,000 gallon tanker and a second engine up there. Okay. And then we have a very unique relationship with a private school, Salberry Private School, that's midway between the two. and. The story behind that is a number of years ago, I think we had 24 calls at the private school in one year. And we, it was getting to be a drain. They started working to try to correct that. And then there were also some people they hired that were firefighters. Okay. So we came to the agreement that if they had enough to fill a truck, we'd put a truck at the private school. Right now they have four people on staff. We do have a truck at the private school that responds relatively quickly since they just have to run down to their little garage and hit the road. Right, right. What an awesome way to you know, involve your community, mm -hmm. make sure that your coverage area is covered, and get the personnel that you need. Absolutely. Volunteerism around here, you know, actually across the country, has been declining since the you know, 70s, back when we all started. Uh, so you know, reaching out and figuring out the ways to keep that volunteerism is pretty cool. Yeah. You guys have... How many volunteers? So we have about 47 people on the roster, of which 25 or so are active first responders. Okay. During the day, we do not have a paid crew, but okay. we are out the door in a minute. And the way we've accomplished that, we have a number of members, especially since the pandemic started, that now work at home. Okay. They didn't want to be in their kid's bedroom. We set up virtual offices in our building. So we have folks during the day that are actually virtual office right. working here. And when the bell rings or the whistle blows, that first truck, as I said to you earlier, I live maybe a half mile away during okay. the day. I do not make the first truck. Wow. It's out the door really quick. Okay. That's a, another good way of thinking outside the box to make sure you're getting the trucks out and making sure the service is done. Absolutely. So we're making our way from your banquet hall. We're going to go upstairs, which is where your crew room is. You got some offices and yes. stuff like that. Do us a favor, before we head upstairs, hit that subscribe, hit that notification, so we can keep bringing you more. We're trying to hit that 50,000 mark in just a couple of months. All right, now I want to show you our crew lounge. Okay. What we've done is we've come upstairs. This is part of our new addition that was done in 2012. We put a small day kitchen up here, so the guys, if they want, can make popcorn, you know, sodas, things like that. We didn't want to put a full-size oven. We have one down in that kitchen. And it also is just safer not to have it up here. Right, um, right. But if I need a little lunch or snack, it's easy to It's easy to here. do here. Right. And then up here, that's our paramedic's office. Again, he's the one that's 24-7. Okay. We have a bunk room that sleeps four. Okay. The lounge with the TV. Um, a little bit of a library that nobody reads anything anymore, though. <laughs> we moved all of our trophies up here, except... Once we get done and we show you in our museum, we have some very special trophies that we want to probably point out to sure, you. Sure, sure. And then in the back, we've got the chief's office, we have my office, and we have a um, small conference room for the officers to meet in, um, as well as, again, one of our virtual office members 
uses that during the day. Okay. This is an awesome use of space. You're upstairs, you're away from the engine bay, so you're not worried about all those car set engines. It right. kind of meets the NFPA regulations. Yes, it does. Having this as a cold zone. You got very homey up here. Even though it's offices around the corner, it's kind of square, you got a place to sit down, you got your dinner table, uh, you got all your pictures on the wall to kind of let you know where you come from and where you're going. Absolutely. So. And, and that's what we designed this for. The more people that want to just hang during the day or night, right. the quicker we get a truck out there. Right. And I, you also have a little patio I see yes, over in the corner. Yes, we do. Corner. Um, we have so. a balcony that uh, is a popular spot. New Hope, every once in a while, will do fireworks. Okay. And from this balcony, right. we got the best view in the house looking down that direction. Right. You can stand out here, enjoy it, read a book. Look at the balcony. And believe it or not, we've actually sparted, spotted a few headers from this balcony <laughs> in uh, self-dispatch. Right, right. I love the way you guys brought your trophies up in a trophy case. And, uh, you know, trying to get those new members in here, the younger generation, mm -hmm. and let them know, you know, why is it important to be a part of a fire company? For the community and stuff like that by putting trophies up and let you know hey we are not just a fire company we're family yes. we compete in different things we work together uh that's tradition that's what firehouses are all about and, and our tradition is as i said 200 years old um we're very proud of that the community is very proud of it and they support us not just because of that but we look at ourselves we're not a fire company we are sort of the go-to in the community uh, just this week, we were called somebody begging us to rescue a parrot. They didn't need to beg. You know, we got a crew together, we went up, we chased the parrot. Three <laughs> different trees rescued the parrot. We've rescued foxes, deer, right. we've searched for people's things. And in the end, we're here for the community. They know that, they know they can call us if they need us. Right, right. So if I were in this community, or maybe I just moved here, how do I become a member with you guys? You just come in the door, so as we, so we have a paid medic 24-7. We also have a paid fire inspector uh, and fire marshal. And so there's usually always somebody here, normal business hours, 8 to 4.30. Okay. If not, Tuesday nights, 7 o'clock is drill night. Okay. So we try to be very open there. Or you can respond on Facebook or on our web page. So okay. we, we try to put it out as many ways as possible. Awesome, awesome. Now, do I have to have certifications before I come, or do you? We do not. Okay. So um, we welcome anybody into the company. We obviously would love folks to eventually become a firefighter. What we have found, though, we also have fire police. Okay. And we have the Marine Rescue. So the Marine Rescue is two weekends of training, and you can be part of our Marine Rescue team after two weekends. Uh, Firefighter One, as everybody knows, it's sort of a sore point, is almost 200 hours. Right. That's very difficult. We do a lot of in-house training. So we've worked with the county. We're doing another Firefighter One class. A lot of it is going to be done online and here. Okay. So we're trying to take that almost 200 hours and make it bearable for people to get through Firefighter One. Right. Or you can be a chauffeur. Okay. And for chauffeur, you have to take Pump One and then you have to have X number of hours on the piece of apparatus you're driving, show us you know how to drive it safely, pump it. And then at drill night, if you're a chauffeur, we still put you in turnout gear, we still show you how to use breathing apparatus and everything else. So as a chauffeur, you can still throw a ladder and know how to do those things correctly. Very but you cool. don't have to do the right. 200 hours. So you're not looking just for a new, younger generation. You're looking for anybody that wants to come out. Anybody. Here. We have membership that ranges from 14 years old, now our junior members, to I think our oldest active firefighter member who's here on at least half the calls is I think 75. Wow. That's awesome. And, and he's probably, uh, he is more fit than me, <laughs> which isn't a stretch. All right. All right, so what else do we have to see here? We have just the museum left, or is there anything So we on? have the museum, and then I think we'll finish up at our 9-11 memorial. Anybody in this business, that is a revered day, and yeah. we've spent a lot of time architecting our 9-11 memorial. All right, let's go take a look. Awesome. All right, and now, especially since our 200-year anniversary is coming up, I'd like to show you what we think our piece de resistance of the firehouse, which is the Delaware Valley Fire Museum. Okay. Which is made up of a collection that we had over our 200 years and also things that have been donated or loaned from other fire companies and other okay. private individuals. So this isn't just your fire station. This is 
anybody that wants to contribute to the anyone that would like to contribute there's i'd say probably 60 percent of it is our stuff and the rest was things that were donated okay. if they want to donate can they still donate stuff here absolutely and what they would need to do is contact our curator who i'd like to introduce you right now all right so Lori Stockton is our curator of our museum. Hi, Lori. And I'm going to let her Thank you for meeting me. for this. Nice highlight. to meet you. Thank you for coming. So you have a very beautiful place here. Thank and you. I hear you got a ton of information for us. I do. What are some of your most favorite things that you have in here? Well, we have something kind of rare. We have um, a poster here, a firefighter McGowan, who was actually a 19... Um, 1923. It's very rare to find a photograph with the actual equipment that he wore. So if I had it blown up so that you could see it better. Um, the firefighting equipment was actually his dress uniform okay. and his um, helmet. And we have it here. His dress uniform was wool. It has an, um, a buttonable um, front number so that if he went to a different company he could still wear the same dress uniform and they were expensive and the dress uniforms are paid for by the firefighters themselves right right and you have his belt and you have his he's very proudly holding his helmet that's awesome to have that gear here and yeah. show the history of that it's what are some other pieces that you really enjoy here well I love the um, 19th century Pompier ladder. Um, actually, the Pompier ladders were developed by Napoleon in the 19th century. Um, he wanted to standardize equipment in France, and it became so popular that Germany became the biggest producer. It's very hard to use because it goes flat against the building. The spike goes through an opening. A firefighter would then have to creep up the side of the building and belay a person to the ground using rope. Okay. Now, that's only one flight high. Right. If he had to go up a second flight, someone would either have to come up with, uh, with another ladder on their back for the second story, or he would have to take this and somehow hoist it up to the second floor so you could see how strong you had to be to do something like absolutely that. absolutely but it's cool that you have that piece here it is and it was a very generous donation right. from a local person right some of the other things in here you have an old hose cart you have yes. equipment the hose cart is actually from mid to early 19th century it was purchased by um, the eagle fire company in the late 19th century and fully restored as you can see they did a stunning job wow now original the, blue, not red. Yes, yes. Fire, fire uh, carriages actually came in many different colors, and they were very highly embellished. And actually, the only thing I can think of more embellished than a fire truck would have been um, circus trucks, really. <laughs> but the fire companies have always been very proud of keeping their machines very well um, cared for and uh, just beautifully uh, designed. Wow, wow. Uh, the, the, I have to point out that the hose is not from the 19th century. The hose is an early 20th century um, innovation, okay. actually, for its time. Um, it is leather, as were the hoses in the old days. Right. And they used to be stitched, and they leaked like crazy. Okay. And this is studded, and as you can see, the studding would not only hold the leather together better, but also uh, give you a little traction because leather is slippery when it's wet. Right, right. And around the corner, you have a bunch of displays. You have I some do. of your other. Yes. I have a fire repel suit. Now, this is state of the art for 1950. Looks like state of the art now, something in the sci fi movies. It does, really, doesn't it? It actually looks younger than the 1973 suit over there, <laughs> yeah. which is part of the turnout gear. Right. Um, but this is triple sealed. And it is um, asbestos underneath. It's aluminum on top. Okay. And even the, um, the air, breathing, packet's the air covered. packet is covered very strongly. It comes in this chest. Okay. And there are very specific instructions on how to wear it, how to ship it, how to take it off, how to clean it. A single scratch and it would have been thrown away because it was used for chemical fires. It was essentially their hazmat suit. Right, right. And so the boots go over the um the legs okay the mittens go on you can't do much in this suit except maybe wield an axe or a hose right right man that'd be difficult to work in it would be very very so i had an opportunity to walk through here earlier when we were doing the first walk around and i saw this twirly thing yeah. that was around the corner what is that thing about this is a fire rattle from the 18th century it is our oldest piece it is on loan and um, what would happen is that there were fire marshals that were hired from dusk until dawn. And the fire marshal would wander the town and look for smoke or fire. If he saw any, and it would have been a him back in the old days, um, he would wave this rattle around, which was like an extended 
um, noisemaker from New Year's Eve. Okay, yeah. So it makes a really raucous noise. And firefighters would come and local people would come with their buckets because what they had then was the bucket brigade. Right. And they would have their leather buckets with the name of the uh, person, the family on it. And they would run out in whatever they were wearing. So hopefully it was something wool. <laughs> right. And they would queue up and um, they would hand their bucket to the firefighters who would then throw it on the blaze. Okay. Now they didn't get those buckets right back right away. The buckets would be collected. Right. And that way people knew who had helped and who hadn't. Yeah, yeah. That's one way for accountability, who's who's who was able to make it and right. participate in the neighborhood. And also missing people. I mean, which is a horrible thing, but that doesn't right. happen. Right. So. Now, it's not all about old equipment here, but you also have a 9-11 kind of memorial in the corner here? We do, yes. Yes, we have, um, this is the start of it actually. This is the Stairway to Dedication by Jim McGinnis, who was commissioned to do a piece um, commemorating the firefighters who were so brave during 9-11. And as you can see, everyone is fleeing for their lives except for the noble firefighters. I'm sorry, I get chills every, yeah. every time I see this. Noble firefighters going up and doing their jobs and keeping calm. Right. And now out front, we have a lovely um, a memorial with a piece from the uh, World Trade Center. Okay. Um, and um, that is a permanent fixture and it is facing the direction of the Twin Towers. Okay. How about I uh, go talk to the president and we'll go take a look at that. That'd be great. Thank you very much for showing us around. Thank you for, thank you for visiting. Yep. So now we're making our way outside the building. These doors are also made by one of your- Very special. We call them the Cosner doors. Okay. So the Cosner family uh, donated the funds needed for a local craftsman, uh, Chris Cosner is his name as well, right? to manufacture these doors for us custom. Because this whole thing looks like your old building, it right? It does. We had hoped we could put the museum in our original 1908 firehouse. Okay. We couldn't afford to buy it back, so we replicated that here. Uh, and it, it's pretty close. This is a little bigger, a little wider than right. what the original firehouse was. But other than that, it's a pretty good record. I love the fact that you were able to put the memorial and, or the museum in there. Yes. You have a memorial out here from 9-11. Yes. So, you know, we're only an hour, a little over an hour from New York City. Um, and for anybody in this business, 9-11 is a special day right and we do have a ceremony here every year um there were a few members here that did w were at ground zero on 9 11 so it's a, it is a very special day for us so when we built the building we capped it off with a piece of steel and what's special about this steel obviously it came from the world trade centers but right. we actually had a professional engineer come in new york city and ground zero it's exactly that direction. Wow. And then one of our local landscape companies took part um, and they put these plants in and a couple times a year they come in. These are being shaped to mimic the Twin Towers. There's a memorial to the Twin Towers. And this, everything here was donated by local companies. Um, even the surveyor who came in and did that measuring for us and everything else. This is huge, this is huge. It's, it's, a, it's a nice quiet place to come and think. Yeah. Uh, almost made me tear up a little bit. So uh, I heard you actually were one of the ones that went up that day. I was there that day. Uh, I'll never forget it. Um, felt like I could have done more, but uh, we were part of a task force when I was an EMT on the other side of the river. And we went up to try to help out. And, uh, you, you know, I, I tell everybody this, a lot of bad, a lot of good. Saw the best and worst of humanity all in a 24 hour period. Yeah. So, yes. Thank you much. For Thank you very us out. much. This was awesome. So glad to, see. to have you. Yeah. So, once again, this is Heroes Next Door. We just did a station cribs with the new Hut Eagle Fire Company. Do us a favor hit that subscribe, hit that notification so we can keep bringing you more. We're almost at that 50,000 mark, and it's because of you.